Persona 5 Royal with only guns didn't go as well as we'd hoped, so let's try a completely different challenge. Welcome to RPG Challenge Runs, and today we find out if we can beat Persona 4 Golden without using any new skills learned along the way. As always, we'll be playing on a brand new save file on the hardest difficulty setting, which is called Very Hard or Risky, depending on your region. The rules are simple, we can only select skills that we start with. So if one of our own personas or our party members personas learns a new move by levelling up or ranking up a social link, we cannot select that skill in battle. For example, Yosuke starts the game only knowing Garu, Bash and Dia, meaning these are the only moves he is allowed to use for the entire game. Any moves we transfer onto new personas via fusion also cannot be activated, but passive abilities are fair game. We also can't use glitches, hacks or mods. My thoughts before starting the run are that this is going to be quite easy in the early game, but towards the end of the game things are going to become incredibly difficult as our teammates become increasingly useless in fights. We start by naming ourselves Default, since default moves are the only ones we're going to be using. Yeah, I was really stuck for a clever name this time around. After pleasantly greeting our super friendly homeroom teacher for a courage bonus, it's straight into the TV for Yosuke's boss fight. It's worth remembering that on very hard difficulty, you deal out less damage, you take more damage, receive significantly less XP and money per battle, and you're thrown back to the title screen if you die. There are no retry options. With all that in mind and no opportunity to grind before the fight, we have to use up all of our items and play the battle almost perfectly in order to take him down. It's worth noting that most boss fights in this game are very long and often involve repeating the same set of moves, so I'll be speeding up the footage so this video isn't like hours long. This is a good opportunity to have a look at the teammates we'll have for the run and what their starting skills are. Any later abilities unlocked by levelling up or ranking up their social link are banned from this run, but remember the rule doesn't include passive skills as those are not things that you actively select in battle. As you can see, Kanji, Teddy and Naoto will have significantly more more options than our initial three. Before fighting Chia's Shadow, we should really grind to a higher level, so we repeatedly go up and down the stairs to reset the floor. The battles aren't too tough here and healing items are available in chests, it's just really tedious because of the heavy 60% XP penalty because of playing on very hard difficulty. We finally hit level 7 and here are our personas going into the Shadow Chia boss fight. Thankfully the fight is really easy and we don't even need to use the pixie that we leveled up for healing because Yosuke can take care of that. With that done, we form the investigation team and stock up on tap sodas from the shopping district and tiny tomatoes from Juness, both of which are great SP restoring items for the early game. Since Yukiko's boss is on the horizon and she's weak to ice, we take the opportunity to fuse an Apsaris, which we then fuse into a Thornius for its ice move Bufu. Did you know that in the original Persona 4 on PS2, Shadow Yukiko didn't even have an ice weakness? Yeah, she didn't have any weaknesses and she also gave players a lot less money. Yeah, I'm really glad they changed that for Golden. We rank up Yosuke's social link, but we will not be allowed to use these moves as per the rules. Instead of buying better weapons, we choose to buy some medicine and lots of ball lightning, since we can use three of these to easily take down the rare Golden Hand enemies for lots of XP and money. All that's left is to save the game and head on into Yukiko's dungeon. We need to get to at least level 18 before completing this dungeon since we need access to a persona of the Aeon Arcana in order to more easily rank up Marie back in the real world and the lowest level Aeon Arcana is Amino Uzume which is level 18. So that is our goal. To say grinding is slow is an understatement, but Golden Hands really give us a massive boost to our XP as well as the cash we're taking in. We start getting low on items, but a good strategy is to take advantage of the online SOS system to get a tiny amount of HP and, more importantly, SP back in every fight. Not that Chie needs the SP though, since her only available skill that requires SP is Tarakadja. We finally make it to level 18, and after equipping some fire evasion and fire resistance accessories that we found in chests while farming, we are ready to fight Shadow Yukiko. Here are our personas and stats going into the fight against Yukiko, though we'll mainly be using Faunius. With Faunius we're stuck only being able to choose between Bufu, Skewer and Tarakanja, Yosuke's options are still only Garu, Bash and Dia, so he'll be on healing duty. Chie is stuck with only Skewer and Tarakadja, so she's mostly just going to be using basic attacks. 
The first phase of the boss fight goes well and things are looking really easy. We use Fornice's Bufu to get a free all out attack every time her white wall goes down and we guard to block her powerful burn to ashes ability, preventing her from gaining extra turns. She summons her charming prince who's weak to electric attacks and doesn't really do much, but he has a ton of health so he acts as like a bullet sponge. After a while he flees from the fight which made our attacks pointless really, but we focus back on Yukiko. During this phase, Yukiko's move pool expands slightly and when she gets very low, she can begin to use burn to ashes without first missing a turn to glare at us. We get unlucky though as she lands a critical double fang on D, uses the extra turn to burn down Chie with an Aggie and then finishes us off with her final Aggie. We get thrown back to the title screen, but this is definitely a winnable fight. On our second attempt, we completely ignore her charming prince since he's just going to run from the fight after a while anyway and focus exclusively on Yukiko. Despite needing to revive Yosuke a few times with items, we finally take Yukiko down after a really long fight. It's sad that we have to stop Yosuke learning a great new move, but that fight was so rewarding. We celebrate by chilling out with noodles on a rooftop, trying on silly glasses, making friends with the fox and chowing down at the local Chinese restaurant. We also fuse Amino Uzume to help boost Marie's Aeon social link and it's straight back into the TV. We head into Kanji's bathhouse but it's clear the enemies here are no joke, so we head back through Yukiko's castle to attempt to fight the optional boss at the top but it doesn't go well. He just dishes out way too much physical damage. Let's uh, leave that one for now. We keep grinding for a long time. Sometimes the skill that we need to use is right there, but we're not allowed to use it. Like in this battle where Yosuke has to keep using individual Garus on five rock enemies since his Magaru was a learned skill and therefore it's banned by the rules. This uses up a lot of SP, but luckily we now have the Fox in with us, so we can heal SP as long as we can pay up. This guy's so cute, but let's be honest with ourselves, he is war profiteering like mad. I know the money's going to be used to maintain the Inaba Shrine, so it's all for a good cause, but holy cow, he is milking this leaf healing business of his. Armed with our good karma, we fuse a Rakshasa, who sadly won't have any elemental attacks, but he gains a lot of passive skills by leveling up, which is exactly what we need since passive skills are okay in the rules. The bathhouse mini boss on floor 7 goes really well, though to be fair it's hard to lose to this boss. He does the same 4 moves on a repeated cycle, only one of which is actually an attack, so it's easy to just guard and repeat. Like the Yukiko mini boss, he also runs out of SP after a few rounds and just kind of stands there waiting for his attack every fourth move. Poor guy. We're now feeling much more confident, so we go back to the optional mini boss at the top of Yukiko's dungeon. He exclusively uses physical attacks, so I'm feeling like this will be a cakewalk. If we can beat him, then I know we're ready for Shadow Kanji. Things don't go to plan though, as his rampage skill almost one shots the entire party, and we only have two revive items left. After some more grinding we try a second time, but again this just isn't happening. He just has way too much damage output. We go away to grind even more. By this point we're winning most fights using auto basic attacks and it's not even particularly interesting, but at least we're not needing to use much of our SP anymore. After several hours we're back at level 30 and try a third attempt on this boss. It goes much better than before, but we get pretty unlucky and end up dying again. I'm confident we can win this if we get luck on our side. After seven more failed attempts, we finally have this run. We end up using a ton of items and we get incredibly lucky a few times, but he's down and we're awarded with a courage boost and an awesome new weapon for Yukiko. That was intense. We've run out of Goho M's though, so we'll have to do the walk of shame all the way back down to the exit. Time to fight Shadow Kanji. We tried to play pretty aggressively at the start to take down his two bodyguards before starting to attack him. Keeping on top of the healing is the biggest challenge here, as well as managing the status effects that Kanji repeatedly applies to the party. He poisons the boys and inflicts rage on the girls. After about 15 minutes we get him on his own, alone, but his fanatical spark move inflicts massive damage on us all. 
Sadly, this attempt was a loss, but perhaps if we play things a bit more slowly and safely, this fight could be winnable. On our second attempt, we tried to utilise Jack Frost's Mabufu move to knock down one of his bodyguards, meaning the other one has to keep wasting his turn pulling him back up. Once those guys are gone, we tried to get Yosuke to guard a lot so that Kanji doesn't get extra turns from exploiting Yosuke's weakness to electricity. Just in the nick of time, we threw a smart bomb at him to finish him off with all party members alive. What a fight. Welcome to the team, Kanji. Realistically, we probably use him to replace Chie since she can only use physical attacks due to her Bufu attack being banned. Kanji is an absolute tank in this game with a huge health pool and great physical and electric attacks. Back in the real world, we hang out in a supermarket, meet an angry dog, apologize to the angry dog, feed the angry dog, receive a dead fish on a stick for your skate to fight with, and it's time for the third dungeon. Before we go in though, I should mention that we're not going to be using the strategy of fusing a Kaiwan with Victory Cry on the 24th of June. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, it's possible to get an incredibly powerful move called Victory Cry early in the game on this particular date. The move fully restores HP and SP after every single fight, meaning a large portion of the community considers it to be at worst a cheat and at best an exploit. Either way, everyone pretty much agrees that it removes all challenge from the game, so we won't be doing it. We start grinding XP again by farming lower level enemies for a while to prepare for the optional boss at the top of Kanji's bathhouse. But we make a really silly mistake, during a shovel time we choose skill level up. This is a rare card that's normally amazing, but in this run it's really bad. You see, our kill shot gets upgraded to torrent shot, but since this is technically a new move, we can't use it. Yes, I'm being strict here, we now have one less skill to work with. Our first attempt at the optional boss in Dungeon 2 seems like it's going well, but our healing just can't keep up with the high damage output. This boss loves to exploit weaknesses, so we don't have much of a chance until we, you guessed it, grind some more. At this point, I'm mostly skipping the footage of me farming enemies, as it's pretty repetitive and we don't want this video to last an hour. While grinding, we fight the mini boss in Reese's Dungeon, who turns out to be a cakewalk since it's weak to fire. The trick here is to equip party members with the disinfectant accessory before the fight begins so they don't suffer from the poison that it's repeatedly trying to dish out with Virus Wave. You hit its weakness! Let's oh, fight. It will end here! Back to the optional bathhouse boss, the second attempt is going much better. We can now tank two attacks from skills that we're weak to, and although we use a truckload of items, we take them down. The reward is a massive courage boost and a better weapon for Kanji. Nice! Time for the main event, Reese's boss fight. This is a strange boss fight because if you know what's coming then the fight is incredibly easy. As soon as she analyses the party we just constantly guard with the exception of one single basic attack until the story event triggers. This isn't the real fight here though because Shadow Teddy is up next. Okay, I'm going to apologise for the speed of the footage here and for chopping some of it out. This battle alone lasted 45 minutes. Our strategy here was to get poke damage in with basic attacks while Yosuke and Yukiko used Dia to do small amounts of single target healing, since they're not allowed to use any other healing skills. As time progresses, our items begin to run thin and Teddy's attacks are only getting more powerful and less telegraphed. For example, in the early and mid parts of the fight, you can predict when he's going to use Mabufula, meaning you can guard it to prevent being knocked down and therefore rewarding him with extra turns. However, in the later part of the fight, he can use this move with no warning, which can devastate the party. We're now so close to beating him, but we're, we're having to use Peach Seeds to heal for 20 HP each. We literally have no other healing items left. We also lose Kanji and we have no way of reviving him. At this point, it's now or never. It's obvious he's going to wipe us out next turn, so we have to kill him first. We get everyone to use damage dealing items for the maximum possible amount of reliable damage 
but alas, it doesn't quite kill him. He's surely on 1 HP. I expected we'd get wiped out at this point and would have to go grind for another few hours, but Teddy wastes his turn with a Maracunda, giving us an opportunity to finish him off. What an amazing fight! And I say that about all the bosses, but the satisfaction you get after beating bosses during the challenge runs is absolutely incredible. Back in the real world, we get a broom weapon for D from the cleaning club and a grilled corn for Yosuke. I totally love the wacky weapons you get in Persona 4. They make absolutely no sense, but they're generally much stronger than anything from the blacksmith. On the 1st of August, we head back into the TV to capture Mitsuo. We start by fusing a Black Frost who has great stats, lots of passive abilities and no elemental weaknesses. It does take quite a lot of money to set up this 5 way pentagon fusion, but it's definitely worth it. He also flies ahead to level 43 since fusions on this date get a much bigger social link XP boost. After we level up to 42, we also get Hanuman who's great for dealing with physical attackers and can revive dead teammates. We also put Teddy on the team instead of Yukiko, partly due to his powerful Bufula attack and wider move pool, but mainly for his amazing Meteorama skill, which is the only AoE healing ability that any of our teammates will be able to use in this entire run. The optional boss at the top of Reese's dungeon was easy due to its ice weakness, low health pool and telegraphed attacks. We're rewarded with our usual courage bonus and a weapon for Teddy, although we don't equip it as his current weapon is arguably better. The mini boss on floor 7 of Mitsuo's dungeon was also quite easy, due to the almighty hands that are summoned in being weak to ice as well. It does get our health low a few times, but there were no tricks or surprises here. Mitsuo's dungeon can be quite dangerous due to shadows almost fully blocking the narrow corridors, so you pretty much need to take every fight. This is fine though, because we have quite a bit of grinding to do as usual. The grind here isn't as bad as normal, but our SP suffers more than usual. Luckily, we already have the Fox Social Link rank 9, so he gives us big discounts. Though, he still growls at us for some reason. We fuse our Hanuman, despite its weakness to electricity, he has plenty of good passive abilities and can learn the passive ability Endure at level 47, which gives us a second shot at any battle that we're struggling with. Since every death sends us back to the title screen, even if we haven't saved in an hour, I cannot emphasise how great this ability is. Mitsuo boss fight time, and here's our setup going in. D's setup is decent with all round strong damage and defense. The paper armband here was a gift from Nanako after the last set of exams and offers a plus five to all stats, which is amazing. Yosuke is rocking his powerful grilled corns, even though bosses can't be silenced, so we won't be getting any benefit from this ability. His arm is also quite poor, but we don't have access to anything better right now. Kanji still has his iron plate, which is pretty good, but again, his armor is poor. Teddy's weapon is strong and offers a good plus 4 agility bonus to help him dodge attacks, but again his armor is poor and his endurance talisman could be better. For personas we're relying mainly on Hanuman who has 3 decent moves that we are allowed to use plus 5 passives, but we can swap to Black Frost if necessary. The only move we're not allowed to use here is Ice Break since it's a non-passive skill that he learned from leveling up. We go into the fight and D immediately lowers Mitsuo's defense with Rakunda. Despite that, I'm still surprised at how much damage we're doing. Yosuke's skills are really poor now, so his role here is mainly to use items, including Hell Magatamas, which each deal a huge 150 damage. The battle honestly isn't too difficult so long as we keep the damage up, because we have to get Shadow Mitsuo out of his hero body and keep him out for as long as possible. Every time he builds another hero suit, he levels up and becomes a lot stronger. Luckily, he only manages to suit up one extra time, and despite some close calls later in the fight, he goes down. This was definitely the easiest and fastest main story boss we've faced so far. After the fight, we spend some time relaxing with friends to raise a variety of social links, and we also use a thin wooden fishing rod to catch a fish bigger than a human male. After stocking up on a few more items, it's back into the TV for Naoto's Dungeon. I've always liked the feel of Naoto's Dungeon. I think the secret military base aesthetic, layout, and the fact that you're heading down instead of up makes it feel really interesting and unique. Just don't talk to me about how long these doors take to open, oh my 
god. Farming here means opening hundreds of these doors and it makes you want to cry. The mini boss here is super easy though since he's programmed to spend the majority of the battle repeating a two move cycle of charging up and then hitting everyone with a physical attack, which means we spend half the fight just guarding. When he gets low he uses last resort to self destruct but it doesn't do a lot of damage. Not very interesting boss but certainly an easy one. While farming for XP and quest items we suffer one of the famous crashes that sometimes happens on the PC version of this game, losing us almost an hour of progress. Ugh. Still it's worth it so you guys get to see the amazing HD visuals, they clearly put a lot of effort into making this game look so much better than the Vita version, although to be fair the game was an amazing portable experience. Before fighting Shadow Naruto, we do the usual detour back into the previous dungeon for the bonus optional boss. This time it's Escape a Soldier who is capable of inflicting insta kills using Mudoon and inflicting fear, confusion and rage with his relatively strong physical attacks. Despite having weaknesses to both ice and wind in the original Persona 4, here in Golden he sadly doesn't have any weaknesses. Even so, we have more than enough healing items to just tank through his attacks so this was an easy win. Shadow Naruto time, this boss is renowned for using a wide variety of elemental attacks to knock allies down in order to chain extra turns, therefore we want to get ahead of the game by putting up various reflective mirrors early on. We're hitting hard but she is too by using moves such as Heat Riser and Debilitate during her extra turns to put herself at a significant advantage. We keep healing through her damage and aiming for 2 attacks per round but the fight gets harder as the phases continue. We try to guard her attacks when she's clearly aiming to exploit a certain character's weakness which is normally Kanji. As she gets low, Yosuke inflicts silence upon her with his grilled corn weapon which stops her from using her elemental attacks. I genuinely didn't even realise that this boss could be silenced to completely shut her down. That strategy will come in very handy in the future. With a couple of final strikes from D and Yosuke, she's down. Honestly, that was another really easy fight where the limited number of skills didn't really feel like much of a problem and we barely even had to grind at all. In the enormous 2 month gap before the next dungeon we focus on maxing out a lot of our social links, we start tutoring, spend a lot of time gardening for great battle items, overfeed a cat to bursting point, ace our exams and host a rock concert. We get to mid November and it's time for Nanako's dungeon. As always, before heading in we first go for the optional boss at the end of the previous dungeon. We swap out Yosuke and his grilled vegetables for Naoto who is one of the most overpowered and broken characters in any Persona game. I won't go into detail why because that's for another video but needless to say she can single handedly take down entire mobs of enemies even if they're different types. For the optional boss Extreme Vessel, the trick is to repeatedly exploit its elemental weaknesses without falling victim to his. We don't always go for the all out attack, instead leaving him down for the extra damage and accuracy bonus. It takes out Teddy but we revive him and Naoto's wind attack Garadine continues to carry the fight. It's over really quickly. Before pushing too far into Nanako's dungeon, we fuse a Narasima and level it up until it learns Auto Mataru, which automatically buffs the party's attack power for 3 turns at the start of every fight. But we're not sticking with this persona, we instead use it in a quad fusion to create Tam Lin, who has various elemental strengths and no elemental weaknesses. It knows two moves, a decent single target electric move and a powerful AoE physical attack. All of its other abilities are passives that buff his stats, evasion and allow him to counter physical damage. Tam Lin will be our primary persona for at least one more dungeon. The dungeon itself, Heaven, is quite easy but it's also really fun and quite short. The mini boss is an absolute joke, it only manages to hit us once in the entire fight and we're resistant to the damage anyway. We just use auto basic attacks to quickly take it down. Little do we realise that a humongous challenge is on the horizon, so we run head first into the boss battle. Sagiri's boss fight starts decently well, but it's clear that he has incredibly high health, defence and evasion. He knocks Kanji down a few times to gain extra turns, then changes his strategy to start spamming ice attacks for some reason. He uses quad convergence to change the atmosphere giving massive damage bonuses to wind attacks. Despite us not being weak to wind, he one shots D dead from full health. Wow, just, just wow. We have some serious grinding to do. 
After two hours of grinding Floor 9 of Heaven, we come back at level 77. This time we're playing it much more conservatively by guarding often with Kanji, just to prevent Sagiri from gaining too many extra turns. But a lot of the time he's not really doing anything, he just keeps using fire attacks for some reason, even though none of us are really weak to fire. The AI in this game confuses me sometimes. You'd think that on the hardest difficulty setting, bosses would try to exploit your weaknesses more, but instead it just kind of feels random as to what abilities they use. Naoto continues to be overpowered and hit hard, Teddy's dealing good ice damage and a decent amount of healing, D is barely scraping by, and Kanji just feels like dead weight in this fight. Luckily, Sagiri steals Kanji with his first use of control. He doesn't feel like a threat at all. Later, when Sagiri steals the entire team, we just wait it out with guard until they come back to us. A few turns later, and that juicy cash and XP is ours. Yep, I told you, you don't gain much XP or cash on the very hard difficulty setting. Shame, really. That was a tough fight. Our persona turned out to be a bit of a letdown, so we definitely need a much better one before the next dungeon. Back in the real world, almost all of our social links are maxed out at this point, so we just spend a lot of time at the cinema to give staff buffs to our party members, plus the level ups will help reduce grinding a bit later on. The cinema is a bit of a hidden gem if you're stuck for something to do in this game. It works a bit like the Jazz Club in Persona 5 Royal as being the only way to raise your party member stats beyond their normal level up bonuses. We soon discover who the murderer is and we're on course for the true golden ending. Please note I'm not going to say the killer's name out loud to avoid spoilers but that person will appear on screen very soon. So when I give the spoiler warning you may wish to minimise the window or look away if you ever plan to fully play this game. Look. I know the game was released in 2008, so most people know who the Persona 4 killer is by now anyway, but I'm going to be fair because I had the killer spoiled for me partway through my first ever playthrough of this game and it took a lot of the fun out of it. Anyway, we grab an exam reward from Nanako's Cushion that allows us to endure a mortal blow once per fight, finish reading all the books, and head into the killer's dungeon. The first mini boss here isn't a challenge, it's just tedious because it keeps summoning duplicates of itself. It's at this point I realise that this challenge is getting a bit too easy. So let's turn it up a notch. How about this? From this point onwards, D can only use a persona that exclusively knows healing skills. That way we're relying on our underpowered teammates, plus Naoto, to carry every fight by being responsible for most of the damage. Of course, D can still use basic attacks and items, but his persona skills can only be healing. We fuse an Ishtar who is a great late game healer and we ensure that she has plenty of great passive abilities. Her two usable skills are Media Rahan to fully heal all teammates and Samarakam to fully resurrect a dead teammate. We go fight the optional boss at the end of Nanako's dungeon just for completion's sake, even though it's an easy fight because it just kind of stands there and uses pointless moves such as stagnant air while failing to exploit our weaknesses. We pick up the Chakra Ring reward which is an accessory that halves SP costs of magic skills but we definitely won't be needing it or using it. The second mini boss in the killer's dungeon is quite tanky and uses some decent mega allowance but it relies too heavily on inflicting panic and just serves to delay the fight. Next we fight the killer of Persona 4. Again, I'm not going to say their name, but that person will be appearing on screen now. Spoiler alert, I'll let you know once they're gone. Here we go. The killer has high defense, so it's clear from the start of the battle that this could take a while. The killer continues to use various elemental attacks to exploit weaknesses, but luckily our Ishtar has no weaknesses and even absorbs wind, so we're barely getting affected by any of the attacks. Two of us get inflicted with fear towards the end of the fight, but Risei instantly cleanses it. As two others get inflicted with fear, we finish them off. I like how D was the one to deliver the final blow there. Okay, the killer is now off screen. I'd still consider the remaining content to be a spoiler, but definitely not the main story spoiler. We're fighting a giant eyeball now, and this guy packs some seriously high stats and incredibly powerful moves. His Agni Yastra and Nebula Oculus moves in particular deal massive amounts of damage, and we're regularly taking casualties. Teammates are regularly going down, so we have to carefully resurrect them with items or with Ishtar Samarakam, while also trying to minimize damage being inflicted to D. At one point we endure a hit at 1 HP while Kanji is also super low, but we slowly turn it around. This was very much a poke fight where we focus primarily on healing and reviving while trying to occasionally get the odd hit in. 
After almost half an hour, Amino Sagiri finally falls. That was by far the hardest fight in the game so far, and we don't gain any XP or money as a reward. That's probably because in the original Persona 4 that was kind of the end of the game, but here in Golden we have an extra final dungeon to beat. Before we do it, we get everyone's third Persona Awakenings, although we can't use any of the new moves anyway, so we just delete them. We also get a giant fish for Kanji to smack people with and go into the TV for a bit of training. While levelling up here, we're reminded of just how overpowered Naoto is. Most of the time she goes first and chains extra turns to delete everything before anyone else even gets a turn. We're at level 93 and oh yes we're fighting the Reaper. For anyone unaware, the Reaper is an optional super boss that appears in most Persona games and is designed to be incredibly difficult to take down. Here he repeatedly uses Mega Glaon for AoE almighty damage that we cannot block in any way and it's strong enough to basically two shot kill anyone on the team. Eventually he switches up his skill choices to focus more on elemental weaknesses and insta-kill moves. For a while things are going extremely well but after we revive Kanji, D gets hit with a Mamu Dune which is a one-shot kill. Hmm, maybe we need to level up a bit more then come back. After over an hour of grinding we're back at level 98. He's still hitting hard but this time our stats turn the fight in our favour as we can now keep on top of the healing much more easily. Teddy keeps dying but he's kinda squishy so that's not surprising. The Reaper gets low and both Kanji and Teddy are dead but I'm worried about being insta-killed so we go aggressive to kill him instead of trying to resurrect our dead teammates. It pays off and we hit the final blow killing one of the hardest bosses in the game. We're rewarded with an ultimate weapon for D which is a sword with massive damage, 96 accuracy and a high crit chance. Back in the real world we fuse an Isis and take her to the coffee shop to gain an Absorb Ice skill card. After buying some better gear we equip Ishtar with the Absorb Ice passive ability which replaces Evade Ice. Once again a reminder that passive skills are ok according to the rules and we need to take any small advantage we can get. We arrive at Marie's dungeon, the Hollow Forest. The special gimmicks with this dungeon are that you lose all of your existing items and equipment and can only equip or use things that you pick up in this dungeon. That means that we're grinding for items instead of XP now. Also all party members lose half of their SP at the end of every battle but regain a tiny amount of it back via special accessories gained throughout the dungeon. Naoto is still incredibly overpowered since most enemies here have a range of weaknesses. I thought the heavy SP penalties would totally shut Naoto down but her invigorate ability and ring combined provide enough SP for her to continue to wipe out entire mobs. We're all max level by the time we reach the gorgeous king mini boss on floor 4. This guy loves regularly summoning extra enemies as well as silencing Naoto to stop her popping off like she normally does. Very clever. After almost 10 minutes he finally falls, so we defeat his final summoned ally and we keep moving. The Heavens Giant mini boss on the 7th floor nullifies every element and resists both physical and almighty damage. Despite his varied attacks we don't suffer too much so he goes down after a lengthy fight of mostly basic attacks. Marie boss fight time and in the first phase she doesn't really do anything so we quickly take her down without much strategy at all. However in the second phase we fight Kasumi no Akami who repels every element and barely takes any damage from almighty attacks. The trick here is to use the elemental break items found throughout the hollow dungeon to temporarily create openings through which to attack. As it happens most of our break items are wind which is good since we can rely on Naoto's Garudine while everyone else mostly guards, heals or uses items. Some of her attacks are decent but we're never really in any danger. The fight takes a little over 20 minutes but once again we receive no XP or money from the win. After discovering the real identity of a certain character, which again I won't spoil, we're off into the final dungeon of the game. The first mini boss here is an absolute joke and dies in three turns. Meanwhile the second mini boss puts up a bit more of a fight by regularly inflicting fear but it still goes down within a couple of minutes. We rush past all of the enemies in this dungeon without taking a single fight since we're max level and we don't need the money. Before the final boss, let's take one last look at our setup. We're still with Ishtar who only knows Media Rahan and Tamarakam to heal and resurrect teammates. We could have used a really overpowered persona like Yoshitsune but where's the fun in that? Our equipment hasn't changed and our three party members Kanji, Teddy and Naoto are all level 99 with reset level 98. Let's do this. 
In the first phase, we start off the battle strong, but as an army regularly charges up to prepare to hit massive Mega Delaums, we make sure we guard all of these so we don't get one shot killed. Our lack of skill choice is really showing now, since we don't have access to any stat buffs or debuffs that would have been incredibly useful here. Our move pool is also very limited, with our best moves being Naoto's Garadine and Teddy's Bufula. We get her to zero health, and after a few turns of being impervious, we bring out Igor's shiny gift and move on to fit. Too. This is where the fight really begins. Is an army now has some new tricks with moves such as Fury of the Yasagami and World's End dealing massive damage. She also occasionally goes for elemental knockdowns on Kanji or Teddy to give herself extra turns. Overall, Kanji is pretty useless in this fight since Izanami drains electricity so you can only use basic attacks or items. We make sure to keep getting D to guard in case she gets a lucky one shot kill, although we do have Endure and Reese's Resurrect as extra chances. D mainly uses Meteorahan most turns though since her damage output is insanely high. We slowly get her to super low health to trigger the final part of the fight, losing everyone to thousand curses, being encouraged by our social link friends, using the power of friendship to become invincible and launch myriad troops at his army to defeat her and complete the run. Can you beat Persona 4 Golden on the hardest difficulty without using any new skills you learn along the way? Yeah, you definitely can. Honestly, it was an interesting challenge and we managed to finish it in about 50 hours, which included getting all social links to max, reading all books and completing most of the quests too. Surprisingly, the first half of the game was much harder than the second half when I expected it to be the other way around. I suppose in the early game, players are more reliant on having good moves, whereas in the late game, you can mostly rely on your social links and equipment, providing your damaging moves are at least decent. Whew. That was a long video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have an idea for a Persona Challenge run, let me know down in the comments section or on Discord. I want to hear your ideas, and thanks for your support with these videos, we're still new and it'd be great to grow this channel up. That's all from me and our friends in Enabar for now. GG guys, and see you in the next one. Cheers. Hey Senpai, if you enjoyed this video then why not give it a thumbs up, and consider subscribing for more Persona Challenges. See you next time.